Well then, Bunny, it is time once again for another incredible feat of edutainment with a brand new installment of Steve's Historical Approximations. Okay. Thank you, Bella. This is a semi-regular feature here on the Pope on Film podcast, wherein I, Steve, get a bit of history and reword it in my own unique voice. Yes. Therefore, it's not 100% accurate, but then again, nothing really is 100% accurate. But I, I would say like it's more like 94% accurate, 98% accurate, somewhere in that vicinity. This week's Steve's historical in that in approximations is brought to you by cheap next day Halloween candy. <laughs> Parents, why trick or treat for four hours in the cold when you can go to the store the next day and buy cheap next day Halloween candy? <laughs> Don't don't take any of the M&Ms. The M&Ms are my secret weapon to keep the baby not freaking out. Oh, okay. Okay, try not to take any more. Because I had to do that once today. The baby's like, Mom's not here! I'm freaking out! Ah! Ooh, M&Ms. We got M&Ms, people. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm going to use those for the rest of the weekend. Yes. So, Bunny. Mm-hmm. We have done a number of these things, uh, Steve's historical approximations, and most of them have been somewhat fairly historical, you know? Yes. We're talking about uh, uh, something in history, some historical thing that has happened. Well, I try to be different. Uh Uh-huh. When when people think I'm going to zig, I zag. That's right. And then when people think, I'm going to zag, then I just shit on the floor. Yes. That, that's going to surprise them. They're not going to expect that, you mm-hmm. know? So this time around... And not quite sure what to do about it either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because what do you do when a grown man just starts pooping on the floor? Yeah, I, 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 I you don't want to be rude, but yeah. yet he's pooping and on then, the floor. Yeah. And then when they're cleaning it up, that's when I zag. Uh Uh-huh. Because they're not expecting it. So this time around on Steve's historical approximations, we are going to be focusing on the world of popular music in the 90s. Okay, well, that's still history. Yeah, but I'm still trying to go into a different area that you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. So in the 90s, a rap slash R&B slash reggae group came along. They actually met in high school and one guy went to a girl and said, hey, starting a band, you want to be in my band? And she's like, okay, but can my boyfriend be in it? Sure. And that's how they met. They were in high school and they started a band. Originally, they were called The Rap Translator. Okay. Which is weird because it's a singular thing, but they were a band of three people. So it's weird that they were called the rap translator. They weren't called, you know, they, there also wasn't a band called one white stripe. No, no. They were the white stripes. Mm -hmm. So it was weird that they were called the rap translator. Then they changed their name to translator crew, which makes more sense because there's a crew, but it was translator spelled T R A N Z later. Oh, that's edgy. That's edgy. That's you have created like a like a hurdle right there. Mm-hmm. That's like in the beginning of that thing you do when they want to call themselves the Wonders, but O N E dash D E R S. Like, oh, you you just want people to have a difficulty, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So then after that, they eventually. After the two names, they decided to name themselves the Refugee Camp because two of the people. Two of them were, of the three people in the band, were originally from Haiti. Okay. And then they shortened it from the refugee camp to just the Fugies. The Fugies, okay. The Fugies. The Fuggies. They, they, they sound vaguely familiar. Oh, yeah. They did that wonderful cover version in the 90s of uh, Killing Me Softly. 
Okay. That played everywhere. <laughs> all the time throughout like half of the 90s. The Foogies comprised of three people. Praz, Lauren Hill, with a Y. Just want to be clear, Lauren, L-A-U-R-Y-N, Hill, okay. with a Y. I was thinking, how how you put a Y in Hill? Yeah, no, yeah. no. Uh, and Wyclef Jean. Those are the three people. Wyclef and Praz were both born in Haiti, but they were raised in New Jersey, Brooklyn, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Lauren Hill is American. Their first album that they released in 1994 got some people's attention. Okay, thank you for telling everybody on the podcast that you stink, Maxwell. That's really exciting. <laughs> their first uh, their first album in 1994 got people's attention, but their second album, The Score, uh-huh. was released in 1996, and that features a couple of hits, including their amazing cover of Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly. Huge hit. The album went multi-platinum. They won a bunch of Grammys. And that song, their version of Killing Me Softly, was number two on the U.S. charts. They were I, big. I have totally blocked it out of my memory. So either either that remake only exists in Universe X, or Possibly. I've completely blocked it out of my memory. Because really, why fuck with perfection? Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> so... They were huge, and then in 1997, they broke up, and they went their separate ways. That's what happens when people in the band are dating. Yeah. That's why we don't have any more of the White Stripes. Thanks. Weren't uh, they, wait, 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 White wait. Weren't they, weren't they brother and sister? No, they were husband and wife. They were married. Oh. They were dating, and then they were married, but then... The moment that they broke up, their band became huge. Uh huh. Okay. So they didn't want, they knew that if they're going to be huge and popular and famous and crap, it, the last, it, if we become famous and we're like on talk so, shows and shit, everyone is going to ask us about the divorce. Yeah. Like the last thing that this newly divorced uh, couple wants is to have every interview saying, Oh, is it difficult <laughs> you two to work together? Oh, this must be hard. And suddenly that's the story that everyone's leading with. So they came up with the fake idea, with the fake concept that they were brother and sister. And it worked for a really long time. Oh, okay. So, but, but yeah. that was still a thing. So I'm not just misremembering yeah. it. They, no, they, no. they, uh, okay. That's really yeah, They pretended up. to be brother and sister. Yeah. But they were married. So in 1997, the Fugees broke up. They went their separate ways. And America watched with bated breath to see what these three people would do solo, individually. What would these three people do? And uh, what year was that again? Oh, yes. The year was 1997, buddy. <laughs> No, I don't have much about the year 1997 because we recently riffed 1997 yes. on this podcast because I like doing the year was bits throughout the podcast, whether it's on Steve's historical approximations or not, because I think it's just a funny bit. Yes. 1997 was the year that uh, Princess Diana was killed by Elton John. Yes. But, you know, a lot, a lot did happen in the year 1997. That, that I that I didn't get to mention in the last podcast. For example, in 1997, the Lion King musical made its debut on Broadway and shocked the theater world by staging, during, of course, the tender ballad, Can You Feel the Love Tonight, a hardcore lion sex scene. All right. Is that uh, on stage? Lion on lion sex. Because that is what happened, just to be clear, in the movie, in the Disney animated film, Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Nala's laying down there like, oh, let me lick your face. Oh, I'm laying down. Take me, Simba. There's a sex scene <laughs> in a Disney animated film is what I'm saying. 
Yeah. So when they did the play, The Lion King, they said, let's just go balls out. Literally. <laughs> Lion balls out. And they staged a sex scene in the play. In 1997, Mother Teresa died in Calcutta, and I will never forget her last words, which were, quote, I always fucking hated you dirty-ass poor people. <laughs> Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I see a light. Oh no, I see darkness. I see demons. I see demons. Someone help me. <laughs> so, like, I, I have that embroidered on a pillow. Yes. <laughs> During a boxing match in 1997, Evander Holyfield whispered to his opponent, Hey, only pussies with ridiculous lisps don't bite their opponent's ear off. <laughs> so, and then when that was when, a that uh, was a that was a, an amazing moment in boxing. Yeah, but just to be clear, it was entirely Evander Holyfield's fault. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yes, it and was. then and then Mike Tyson's like, okay, I may have lost my boxing career but i still have all of my millions and then don king is like oh now's a good time to tell you um you've only been making about five percent of all of the money you've been making 95 <laughs> percent of it actually goes to me bye wow and then don king took off so that, that that was fun for everybody in the year 1997 tiger woods became the youngest golfer ever to fuck over 250 porn stars in a single year that is a record that still stands. That is, and he should get a green jacket just for that. Yeah, yeah. Now, here is an actual true story. Here is a 100% true story, okay? Yeah. I figured this out. I figured out this true story of, of a, a strange thing that happened in the year 1997, and I love this story so much. In the year 1997, people are shitting themselves in fear over the so-called bird flu. The avian flu, right? Yes. Uh -huh. People are going nuts over that. So Hong Kong is really worried. Apparently it's Hong Kong and, and there's just a lot of birds. And people are starting to get sick, like super sick, real sick. So yeah. they say, what we need to do, we need to nip this in the bud. We need to stop it before it starts. So you know what they do? What they do? They did the most Hong Kongian thing they could think of. Giant monster. It no, they said, we are going to kill all of the chickens in the city. <laughs> yes, I remember that. <laughs> so you might think, oh, but this is Hong Kong, big city, massive city, bustling metropolis. How many chickens could there be like in Hong Kong? Yeah. That's like New York saying, we're, we're going to kill all the flamingos. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. It's like, okay, there can't be too many. It's... New York City, like how many flamingos could there be? So it's like, this is Hong Kong, how many chickens? They killed 1.25 million chickens. <laughs> 1.25 million chickens Hong Kong had killed. Now, here's my question, though. Uh-huh. How come there is not a horror movie about this? The The slaughter of the chickens? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or if not like a horror movie, then like an art film, because I can see like a young man, you know, struggling to make ends meet. Then finally he gets this high paying job, but he doesn't know what he's going to be doing. Yeah. And it turns out it's killing chickens. And he's haunted. <laughs> he's haunted by the chickens, all the chickens he has to kill. Yes. Yes. But I'm also, I'm also like picturing like a snake Pliskin as a chicken bounty hunter. That's the great thing about this chicken killing story is that we could do like five different types of films. Yeah. 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 He would get paid like per himself. chicken head. Yeah. He'd wear him like a necklace. <laughs> mm hmm. Also in 1997, the Fugees have broken up and all three members are working on solo albums, solo projects. The three members again are Wyclef Jean. Lauren Hill with a Y and Proz. Yes. Here now, here now are their three careers. Proz was tapped 
to record a song for the wildly racist Warren Beatty movie, Bullworth. You remember Bullworth? I don't think I've ever seen it. I remember the movie. I don't remember. You are not missing much, my friend. Okay. You are not missing much. It's pretty racist. So he recorded the song Ghetto Superstar. Uh, and in 1999, his song Ghetto Superstar was the eighth most played song of the entire year. Really? It was a huge, it was a huge hit worldwide. It was a massive smash for pros. But here's how the song goes. If you haven't heard the song, let me sing the song for you. This beautiful woman comes on and she sings and it's get a superstar. That is what you are. This is the part of the song that everyone will remember because my voice is so pretty and it's really nice. <laughs> so when you think of this song, you'll only remember my voice. Well, here comes the part of the song that sucks. It's the part that actually features pros. I'm bringing the whole song down with my raps because I am really bad at this. <laughs> Get a superstar. Really beautiful part. He's the weakest link of his own song. <laughs> I feel the same way about the, about the Eminem song Monster. And it's like Rihanna singing this beautiful chorus. And then here comes Eminem to ruin the song. Bitches, bitches, what? And like, okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. Eminem's a genius. So, so he releases this single and it's a huge, massive hit. And I'm like, oh man, everyone's like, oh man, I can't wait for Praz's album to come out. He releases the album and it bombs spectacularly. And so when it comes to Praz, nope, he's done. Who's next? <laughs> Wyclef, Jean had, without a doubt, the biggest career of the three of them. He released good music. He had a number of hits. His song, Gone Till November, is just a classic. And I love that song so much. Plus, his sol on his solo albums, he did some really weird shit. His, yeah. his first, his album, The Wycleftic, because he, he's being, uh, he, he, he has a, he has two duets on the song. One of them is with The Rock. The Rock? Okay. The Rock. The song is called It Doesn't Matter. That was his catchphrase back in the day yeah. when he was still at the WWF. And Wyclef is like bragging about himself. And then The Rock just, It doesn't matter. <laughs> rock, I, Rock, I just won two new Grammys. It doesn't matter about your Grammys. It's a real weird song. <laughs> it's, a real, it's a real weird song and then and this is amazing my wife actually natasha actually refuses to allow this song to be played in the house okay she banned this next song but wyclef does a rap song with kenny rogers oh man and that didn't ri rip the fabric of space time and it's amazing because because uh, it, it, it's it's Clef. This is Clef out in the country. And who better to set it off when, when you're in the country than this man right here. And before the song even comes on, Kenny Rogers shows up. And he does one of those things that rappers do before the, st the song starts. So it's, yo, this is Kenny Rogers kicking it on the countryside with me and Wyclef. Yeah. And we're wow. going to kick it off right here. And he starts singing his song. But then Wyclef jumps on top of it. It's really weird because literally the song goes like this. You got to know when to hold. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. It's really weird. It's a bizarre ass uh, duet. But Wyclef recorded a song with Kenny Rogers. And I said to myself, That's, yeah, this is reason enough to buy his album. <laughs> He, and then well, the, the why are you doing this for uh, historic approximations and not the Mandela effect? Oh, oh, because I because as uh, because unlike the other songs, I love these ones. OK, if anything, it's like the reverse Mandela effect, because I love this album and I feel like no one else knows of this album's existence. 
No, despite no. The fact that it was like a number one album, a huge hit. It ends with him doing a like this weird rap version of "Wish You Were Here" by Pink Floyd. Oh man! And yet, I played it for my brother, who's seen Pink Floyd like in concert like three times, and he's a huge Pink Floyd fan. And I played it for him, and he's like, "Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty good." So it's an amazing album, and and so Wyclef, he has a huge career. And he's a big success until he ran for president of Haiti for seemingly no reason other than to have people metaphorically suck his own dick. Okay. That's like me suddenly being like, I'm going to run for president of Mexico. Uh huh. Yeah. And I roll into Mexico in like a, like a limousine and shit. Hey, I'm running for Mexican president. And then he had a charity. This is the the thing that really killed his career, not the fact that he ran for president just so people could suck his own dick. Um, but he had a like Haiti had some sort of hideous thing happen to him, so he set up a charity, and then people eventually learned that oh wait, uh, Wyclef is taking about sixty percent of all the money that the charity gets. Okay, for, for himself. That's, and the that's very scene. Trumpian of him. Yeah, it's very Trumpian of him. But yeah, that kind of killed his career. Now he's like, I don't know where he is. Then there's the young, black, strong, empowering, and not at all crazy Miss Lauren Hill. People were like, yes, Lauren Hill. Uh, she's the chosen one. Look at her. She's <laughs> a young, strong, em- empowering female. Uh, she, she, oh yes, no doubt Lauren Hill will be the one with the amazing career. Yes, let's just pile all of this pressure on her. Can't wait for her album. That's going to be incredible. We're all excited. All of the hope is now on her shoulders, right? Yes. So a year after the band breaks up, in 1998, Lauren Hill releases her first solo album. It is called The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. In her personal life, she was dating Wyclef Jean, and then the Fugees broke up when they did, and they broke up because Lauren Hill, while she's touring, she meets a rich-ass Jamaican businessman slash former NFL player. So because they met, Wyclef broke up, so the entire band broke up, so now she's living with this rich Jamaican businessman, and then suddenly she gets pregnant, her life's in turmoil, and that is what her album is about. Okay? It's about pressure, and about being a strong woman, and being pregnant, and trying to make a life for yourself. It debuts at number one on the Billboard charts, her, her new album. Okay. She set records. She set a record for the first week sales for a solo female artist. Her her first single was number one on the the U.S. music charts. She was also the first woman to ever get 10 Grammy nominations in a single year. Wow. And by 2013, her album, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, sold over 19 million copies. This is a huge, massive, seminal album. She becomes an instant superstar. Now, and this and and this year, uh, it would be a classic song. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but then the lawsuit came. Okay. All right. Okay. Now this happens all the time. Some uh, some artist releases this big, huge, massive album, and then some person or some group of people are like, "Hey, we did all the work for this. We're suing. We we demand a cut of the money, and we demand uh, credit on the album." Like that sort of thing happens all all the time. Yeah, happens all the time. But but it, this time it's a group and a group of musicians and producers. They call themselves the New Ark. Okay, and they say that they were hired to help to help create the album with Lauren Hill, and it, Lauren Hill's people. Lauren Hill's like, I can have a band, and Lauren Hill's people and the record executives are like, No, we're going to do a Prince thing. Of course, Prince's music wasn't all created by Prince. He had a band. He had people backing him up. 
Yeah. He had a whole massive army of people helping him, but who got the credit? Prince got the credit. So th- th- that is what Lauren Hill's people wanted that Lauren Hill, you can be like this massive female artist. Yeah. So it, it's going to be just you. So new art came along and they said, we did a bunch of work on this and we demand credit. We demand a cut of the money. And uh, Lauren Hill's people insisted that, that, that no, this was all Lauren Hill. This was her baby and, and she created it and, and she wrote that. But so it's a standard lawsuit, but um, New Ark, the people who were doing the suing, they took it a step further. Okay. They, they alleged in the tabloids, in the New York Times, and yada, 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 they said, no, this isn't your typical lawsuit. You don't understand. We made this entire album. <laughs> okay. We came up with the beats. We came up with the lyrics. We came up with the music. We literally wrote this entire thing. <laughs> this entire album was us. Lauren Hill did nothing. It was all us. Nice. So Lauren Hill's reps say, oh, hey, this is just your typical lawsuit. We will settle this in court. And New Ark hits harder. They said, no, again, you guys don't get it. This album was all us. It, it was in no way her. And here's a good way to prove it. Why don't you put Lauren Hill in a studio and have her do her long-awaited follow-up and see how long that takes? Okay. And when you see how long that takes, that's when everyone will realize that this album, which is selling millions and millions of copies, was all us and in no way her. This was all us. Yes. We were hired to help her make an album. We ended up making the entire album, and we've got no money for it, no credit. Put her in a studio. Put her in a studio, <laughs> and then you will all see what we mean. So eventually, on the DL, quietly, Lauren Hill's people in the, the, the studio, they settle the lawsuit. Yeah. For a reported five million dollars. Nice. But to quote what pretty much everyone is saying right now about Bill O'Reilly, you don't pay that much if you're innocent. Yeah. You pay that much to have something quietly disappear. So especially, lot- especially when you're sitting on a big pile of cash. Mm-hmm. You know. You know what's a what's a hundred thousand to a lawyer fee? Yeah, to defend yourself. Yeah. So with the lawsuit settled, Lauren Hill immediately went to work on her on the follow up to her massively successful debut album. No pressure, no pressure no. or anything like that. She's got this. So two years later, Lauren Hill releases her second album. Okay. Uh huh. Two years later. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Wait, did I say two years? Hold on. Uh, I meant to say three. Three years later, Lauren Hill releases her long-awaited follow-up to the miseducation of Lauren Hill. The long-awaited follow-up to her debut album. Uh-huh. Okay. 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 Oh, wait. I meant to say five. Five years later, <laughs> Lauren Hill releases... Okay. Wait. Hold on. Seven years later, Lauren yeah. Hill... After uh, it's so much waiting, Lauren Hill finally releases her follow-up album. Okay? Okay. Okay? Okay. 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 That's the final number. Okay? Seven years later. You got it? I got it. Okay. Oh, wait. N- hold on. Um, okay. Here, here's the real number. Uh, 2017. <laughs> okay. The year that we're in right now. Uh-huh. We are so- still... We are still awaiting Lauren Hill's follow-up oh. to her 1998 album The Miseducation of Lauren Hill which she says she is still working on. Basically, she is a musical Howard Hughes at this point. I'm uh, assuming she's Yeah. Yeah, or yeah, she I'm was Axl Rose with Chinese Democracy. Yeah. Or uh, 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 Golden uh, Jerry Earring. Lewis, Jerry Lewis with his Nazi comedy. Yeah. 
I'm assuming Lauren Hill is somewhere in a studio saving her urine in jars and wearing <laughs> tissue boxes for shoes. Yeah. However, I will say this. She did hear the skinny, the word on the street. So four years after her, her debut album, she decided to give fans a taste of what she was working on, a little preview with a concert on MTV Unplugged, which apparently... It, it, uh, 2018, it, which apparently in 2002 was still a thing. Yeah. So it was just her, Lauren Hill, and a, an acoustic guitar on stage. So she got up there and she started talking. Uh, and talking. And talking. In fact, some people have called her rambling two CD MTV Unplugged album one of the worst live albums ever. Oh, made. God. And it also started a wonderful national conversation about whether or not Lauren Hill is insane. <laughs> okay. Because she started talking about paranoia and people coming out together and demons and her fighting demons, both metaphorically and literally, and how Jesus saved her and her music actually comes from the angels and yada, yada, yada. Uh, writer Nathan Rabin likens her two CD MTV Unplugged album to the lousy speechifying parts of a Kanye West concert. You know, you go to a Kanye West concert and you're like, oh man, I can't wait for Kanye. And he sings this hit song, then he sings this hit song, then he sings this hit song, then he talks for 15 minutes about how much he loves Donald Trump. Yeah. And how uh, uh, Taylor Swift is a bitch and how anyone who has ever illegally downloaded an album should be killed and people are like, ah, Loved this album, and then Kanye West started talking, and that ruined everything. <laughs> we don't want to hear what you have to say. Just play your music. Yes. Oh. No? So Lauren Hill basically hijacked an audience for her two CD, for her apparently very hard to listen to two CD album, and that's sad. That album was in 2002. Lauren Hill hasn't done a thing of note since then save for a ridiculously short Fuji's reunion and a small stint in jail for tax fraud. <laughs> okay. You know, you know, Bunny, uh, if, if I were in the habit of making possibly legally scandalous statements, then I would say, well, looking at the entirety of Lauren Hill's career, it looks like, yeah, uh, New Ark was right, and Lauren Hill didn't do a thing for her own goddamn album. But I am not in the habit of making possibly legally scandalous statements, so I won't say that. Okay, good. Thank God. We can't, we can't afford another lawsuit. Exactly. But I will say this. That is it for this week's installment of Steve's Historical Approximations, and I hope that you have learned something. <laughs> yes. That was, that was very interesting. Yeah, Lauren Hill and her weirdo album. Weird. It's weird. It's weird. This, this is one of those stories that makes me sit back and think, how did I miss all of this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember that album because that album was huge and like every other person I knew had her album. Really? Mm hmm. I couldn't tell you what any of the songs were, but I bet if I heard the album, there like I would probably know like about half of the songs. Yeah, that's how that's how much it sold back in the day. 